Well, I feel a little bit humble uh, talking after a, an Olympic swimmer, gold medalist, feels me a little bit, well, uncomfortable somehow. But the thing is, probably lots of you have this kind of phone in their pocket or handbags. This phone, or the one that you have, is actually three billion times more powerful than the first electronic computer ever produced. It is actually two million times faster than the computer that was using in Apollo 11. And it is 200,000 times more powerful than the first IBM PC. In other words, the technology over the last 70 years has advanced more than in the previous 200,000 years. And the news is that it's not going to stop. So the question is, what do we do and what will we be doing with this power? Today, you're sending emails where you are surfing the web, updating your Facebook account. That's the exact same thing that we've been doing, at the exception of Facebook, for the last 30 years. So the idea is, by the end of my talk, you will probably take a different look at your smartphone or your computer at home or on your desk. And for sure, you will look at the future with hope and curiosity. Since the beginning of mankind, men and women have invented technologies to enhance their daily lives. And all these technologies were a means to an end. The first computer that was invented by the Allies during World War II to decrypt Nazi's communication was as well a means to an end. Then the personal computer in the 70s and mostly in the 80s changed completely the landscape because it brought in a new character, the geek. And you know, the geeks, and, and I was one, I, I'm st I think I still am, but the geek loves his computer. He sees his computer as an end. And, sorry ladies, no offense, I said he's because most geeks are males. <laughs> but, and when I was studying computer science 30 years ago, we were 200 boys for five girls. <laughs> so we don't have much choice but love our computers. But the whole thing is, internet came in and social networks exploded completely. Who does not have a Facebook account? That's good. So it exploded, why? Just because we are social animals. We crave for interaction. Then we have the touch interface. You know, I, I read a quote by Bill Gates, and Microsoft was the first to release a touch interface. Unfortunately, Apple did a better job. But we, we changed the way that we interacted with these computers. The PC is 40 years old. In the next 40 years, in 2050, it is predicted that a single personal computer will be as powerful or will have as processing power as all human brains on the planet. What will we do with all this power? This is really a, a core question, but the ubiquitous nature of the computer and the smartphone make them ideal choices really to augment our own personal capabilities. And I truly believe that we are entering a complete new age in technology that I call a human-centric computer age. An age where the computer is put back to what it is, a means to an end. An age where the computer embraces all our human senses. And I would like to walk you through a journey into the future around three directions that could be critical in the way that we apprehend technology. And the first one is really around augmenting our experiences through immersive technology. And I would like to, to play a, a little experience with you. I would ask you to close your eyes. Don't worry, your wallet will stay in their pocket, their smartphone in their handbags, nobody will leave the room. Okay? But I would like you all just to close your eyes with me and, and see in your mind this room that we are in. So you see the screen behind me, you, 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 me, you see me talking, y you see the people in front of you, you see the people behind you, and you can even 
walking your mind around this room, no, seeing the ceiling, your feet, and open your eyes now. What you see and what you saw in your mind was probably three-dimensional. We live in a 3D world, okay? Chad would not probably deny that, you know, he swims beneath the water or above the water sometime. I've never tried to walk on the water, not yet. But the fact was that you are in three-dimensional world. But what does happen when you transpose that 3D world onto a screen? So let's, let's take a, a simple experience of what it could be. So I am here turning around this image, okay, and walking and looking at, at that uh, swimming pool, then this house, and then stopping, and then asking the computer to come back, okay, and walking and say, I want to see this, the, the end of the swimming pool, so I want to move forward, and the computer will detect what I'm doing, and I will walk back, okay, and I will continue turning. So you may say, yeah, easy, that's a video. Actually, that's not a video. This set of pictures were taken with that smartphone. It took me 30 seconds, completely automated, and the computer, and generated by the, by the smartphone, and the computer detects my movement through two webcams and one infrared webcam. And so, basically, the computer is not only recreating a sphere around me exactly like I would experience in the real world, but the computer detects my own gestures. So he knows exactly by watching my body what I am doing. So this is immersive experiences. Imagine that each of you in this room would take pictures of your environment, whether you work in a bank, in a hotel, in a, man in a manufacturing plant, or if you want to promote your own products, you know, creating the 3D environment and sharing them just by touching a button. We would create a complete 3D world just scaling by the power of the users. So this is really going beyond video. The second point, or the second direction, I would us to work together is around enhancing or augmenting our interactions. And I was asking whether you had a Facebook account at the beginning. But it's true that you know, most of us are social animals and we're on social networks. But honestly, I find social network experience rather poor. You know, it's what we call asynchronous. I post my, my Facebook status, I'm talking TEDx. Ten minutes later, oh, that should be cool. Well, it's over. And that's the whole problem, basically. Because interaction is real time. There were hundreds of people who wanted to be amongst you this afternoon. Why? Because they wanted to hear the beautiful mu music and story that Jose shared. They wanted to learn from Graham how to become a world champion. And they wanted to hear and feel what being a world champion is. And of course, they wanted to learn more about branding. They wanted the real time experience. Because this is what it is about. It's living in the real time, not asynchronously. So what could be a real time experience while we are 2,000 miles away? So that, that could look exactly like that, where this gentleman is going to write down some, some results on a sheet of paper. And at the same time, we will see another hand appearing that corrects immediately the result. But if you look closely, both hands are not in the same place. Okay, they're actually 2,000 miles away. But what are these guys using? A pen and a sheet of paper. Do they need to learn how to use a sheet of paper and a pen? Well, we learned that at school. But how does this make possible? You see light bulbs around this room. In each light bulb above this guy, there is a webcam and a low-cost projector. And these two elements will allow any type of surface to become a computer screen. And you can even, I was, you know, I was listening to Graham Skyping with his family while in London. Imagine that if you can play a game of cards just while Skyping. So this is going voice and video. This is real-time interaction with usual objects. So this is really, really going beyond just what we have today with voice, video, and social networks. The third direction and, and the last path on your journey is really around what if we could augment really our own capabilities as human beings? You've seen about augmented reality examples in, in a couple of videos and examples that were given previously. Now, the thing about augmented reality is, yes, it's nice while you're doing your shopping, you see some pop-ups 
you know, around saying, hey, you forgot that product or whatever. But what if you could really use augmented reality to alleviate pains and create and save lives? And so just want to, to show a quick clip. And this is so this guy using contact lens. For those who are wearing contact lenses, you know what it is. But this is you know, a strange kind of, of, of contact lens. And what this guy is doing, well, we are 100 people in this room. 20 of us are or will suffer from diabetes. Any of us is concerned. All of us are concerned, actually. Eight of these 20 will require insulin. And the problem is simple. For an insulin-dependent diabetic, if the glucose level goes too low, you may end up in coma and die. Now, the University of Washington, and you may say, what's What's the thing about this contact lens? Well, the University of Washington in the US came up with merging two technologies, contact lens and glucose testing in a teardrop. And by using augmented reality, the contact lens can warn the wearer about her glucose level and get her to take immediate actions to inject insulin. And this is a small and simple idea that can save thousands, if not millions, of lives. I am the, uh, the happy father of three boys. You can imagine at home, it's a little bit hectic sometimes. But the fact is, I keep repeating to my kids, there are no stupid questions. There are only stupid answers. But Pablo Picasso reminds us that, well, computers are stupid. They can only give you answers. It's true. But it is our duty to ask the right questions so that the computer can give us unexpected answers. I was talking at the beginning about the first computer during World War II. One of the inventors of this computer was a man named Alan Turing. And Turing was known for a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behaviors equivalent to or undistinguishable from that of an actual human. But with the power that you all have in your pocket, with this supercomputer you have in the pocket. It's not about creating a computer that behaves like a human being, but taking a human and augmenting him or her with the power of that computer. And the beauty is that it will bring back the computer to what it is, a means to an end. And it is our duty as human beings to leave our goals to, to leave our dreams, and really, this is with your ideas, with your intelligence, that you will transform that computer into a real mean that will augment your capability. You are inventing the future. Thank you.